Welcome to today's webinar, Exploring the BABOP Guide. Thank you all for joining us today in our panel. Today's episode is, What is Value? IIBA, thank you for joining us and for contributing to this webinar by asking questions and considering what our panelists have to say and taking that back into your BA community and practicing what you learned today. I'm your host, Maureen McVeigh, Head of Learning and Development at IIBA. I've had the pleasure of being able to work in a number of domains as a BA over the last number of many years, but uh, I've come full circle. I was one of the founders of IIBA, among others, and I am now um, very pleased to be working with IIBA and hoping that my contribution helps you to develop your career. You can ask questions of our panelists. I'll be monitoring them and asking the panelists to answer your questions. You can also follow us at Twitter and at hashtag Babok. Julie and Sammy, our enterprise architect, has posted uh, the uh, uh, PDF, pardon me, to our blog at community.iiba.org. Babox, you can download the PDF from there. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Mary Gorman. She's one of our panelists today, and she is a prolific contributor to the BA community. She is a Vice President of Quality and Delivery with EBG Consulting, and I can absolutely say she is an expert in business analysis and a wonderful facilitator. Uh, she and Ellen Geidesteiner, her partner, in Crime presented at the BBC webinar with rave reviews and she also presented a webinar earlier so if you're interested in listening to that webinar it is posted at IIBA.org professional development under the archived webinars. Not only has Mary contributed to the business analysis body of knowledge but they have a wonderful book Discover to Deliver uh, Agile product planning and analysis. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. We have Joy. Joy Beatty is a Vice President of Seville, Inc. And I'm sorry about my book toolbar there. And she certainly is a professional and, again, another huge contributor to our BA community. She helps organizations in Fortune 500 companies to implement new methodologies and best practices for requirements. And she's actively involved in IIBA as a core team member on the version 3 BABOC. And she's writing a book with none other than Carl Wiegers, the third edition of Software Requirements. So welcome, Joy. Thank you, Maureen. And Julie and Sammy, many of you probably know him from many webinars, and he contributes an immense amount of knowledge and expertise through Quick Tips for Better Business Analysts analysis. Pardon me. He's also uh, writing a IBA publication in Managing Business Analysis, and is a contributor and contributing editor to the Babok Version Three Guide. He uh, hosts the webinar on effective communications and of course is a big contributor and designer of exploring the Babock Guide webinars. Julian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, glowing hello and, and welcome. Um, it's a thrill to be on this webinar series. I mean, I'm really glad that we've been able to, to put it together. And Maureen, thank you so much for hosting. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Joy is also on the core team for the Babok Guide version 3. This is how we know each other. And she and I have been kind of tearing it up for the better part of two years about some, some various and sundry things. We get along great and have a, a, a fantastic working relationship, which is also based on a lot of argumentation. So be prepared. Uh, I want to start us off just by mentioning what the business analysis core concept model has to say about value. This is a, a definition that you won't see in other places because most business books uh, don't actually define what value means. We use the term frequently, but we, we really haven't defined it in most places. And what the core team did was work our way back to the dictionary and look at what the dictionary has to say about how 
the meaning of value. And so our definition is the importance of something to a stakeholder in a context. This is so, important. Yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, when you're finished your slide, I'm going to launch the poll. Okay, great. Um, so the, the important thing to remember here is that from a, a core concept point of view, the value doesn't just exist. Value is an interaction between stakeholders and some environment that the stakeholder, the person, is in and some thing that is being valued. And the thing doesn't have to be uh, something physical. It could be an idea or uh, an experience. So with that, I will pass back to Maureen for the poll. Yeah, I'm going to launch a poll and I want to make sure everybody can see it. And can everyone see the poll? It was there for a moment, but it just... Okay. There, there it, it is. Oh, uh, we're at the results. I don't think people had a chance to actually... Oh. Uh, uh, it says poll closed now, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> oh, well. My apologies. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to um, get your poll results this way. But if you want to type in uh, your, your thoughts about what value is into the uh, question interface, we can certainly take a look at those, uh, those answers there. Sorry, we, uh, we flipped through the poll a little too quick. So um, most people are, are saying importance right now. Um, which uh, is a nice thing to hear, but uh, there are a few other answers coming in too. Maureen, what, what do you think about the, uh, the list there? Really telling us uh, it's almost 50-50 around importance and something extra, although some people say money, 50%, um, a, to a toss-up between something extra and importance. There you go. So, Money's starting to uh, get up there, though. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that, uh, that that's what uh, people would say. So let's move on. I'm going to talk very briefly about my opinions about what value is, and then we will hand this over to, uh, to I believe, Mary to, to follow on with, with her thoughts. So my first point is that value is not understood. Uh, that doesn't mean that you don't personally have an understanding of what value is. Um, if any of us were to be put in a situation where we need to prioritize uh, something that's really important to us, uh, it's inevitable that we, we understand value. If I had to choose between saving my daughter, myself, or my mother from a burning building, I can tell you uh, that I can prioritize and I know what's most valuable. So. That, at that level, we understand, but when we start talking from a business point of view and from organizational perspectives, we start to lose track of that most basic idea that value fundamentally is about how important something is and that the context matters. Um, I don't want my daughter, who is two and a half, trying to cook me dinner, um, and neither the, my mother or my daughter want me cooking dinner either. So, you know, the, the context matters. Maureen, could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, one of the bones of contention between Joy and I has been the idea that value is money, at least in an organization, and I'll let her speak to that point. I have a different opinion. I think that money is a subset of value. Uh, it's one way of representing one narrow band of value, and that it's critical for business analysts in particular to really understand the difference. And, and this is one of the, I suppose, most telling examples I could come up with. If value really does equal money, then an insurance payout should actually be able to replace an orphan's parents, at least in, in principle. And clearly, the money doesn't replace the parent. So, so what's going on here? Uh, and, and there's lots of ways to, to think about this. And I, I think from a business point of view, it's important to recognize that many purchasing decisions are not based on just straight dollar money uh, or dollars for functionality, but they're based on an experience, on a feeling, uh, on a relationship that a person has with an organization. And those relationships are about value and brand uh, and an experience that goes beyond just the dollars. Next slide, please. And that brings us to um, the, the complexity of the concept of value. This box, um, 
may not want to try to read all of it right now, but this diagram is attempting to show some of the ways that we talk about value and how value can change over time. And it's a, a, a deep dive into one very small section of core concept model, uh, the, the BACCM. And as you can see, simple terms that we use all the time like benefits, uh, which is sort of in the top middle, they can refer to something that we already have. I am receiving benefits when you when you are measuring uh, the performance of a of a product line you're looking at the benefits your organization actually is getting benefits can refer to something that possibly we could get uh, benefits that we want to have that's what you write down when you're writing requirements you don't write down benefits that you got you write down benefits you want and benefits can even be talked about in a timeless sort of sense like what would the benefits be if uh, so there are many, many different concepts associated with value, including prioritization, importance, uh, benefits, rewards, consequences, and so on. So when we talk about this topic, just remember that it's not as simple as it appears at first glance. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over the reins to Mary. Mary, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Julian. I'm really glad to be with you and Joy, and uh, not trying to contradict Joy, but I did see some tweets out there, Joy, and I'm not quite sure, you know, that we're going to get into something um, too explosive here, at least I hope not, but certainly lively. Now, what I'd like to do is to start talking about value with the end. Now, it sounds a little crazy, but when Ellen and I were writing our book, Discover to Deliver, uh, we spent quite a bit of time on a value model. And what you see here on the left side of the screen here is one portion of that value model because we see that a product would first have to have a vision. The stakeholders define the product's end result, the desired outcome. This is the vision for the future. These are the anticipated values. So we could see that the product's vision is going to be amplified by one or more goals and a goal is a targeted result. Now that goal ideally should be a SMART goal, of course, we know. And the ability for us to be able to look at the vision, goal, and objectives, knowing that those are the ends, that is what the anticipated value, and I emphasize the anticipated value for that product is. Now how we get there is by the product box as we show it. And that's actually going to hopefully deliver the actual value. So a successful product delivers value only when it's aligned with the product's vision, goals, and objectives. Another way of looking at it is that the ends answer the question why, and the means answer how. Now I want to uh, carry on a few concepts of what Julian had mentioned, so a little bit more about value here is that it can be tangible. You could see it, you could measure it. Um, an example might be you could increase sales by X amount, and you can evaluate that later to determine if you actually met those particular goals. But as Julian also said, it's not always about money. It could be an intangible. Um, another example is customer loyalty. Um, it's very hard to measure customer loyalty or the fact that the product is cool, in quotes, like an iPhone has intrinsic value, another thing that's hard to measure. Also about value, a product as we envision it must be feasible. In other words, it must be realistic that we could actually build the product and ideally it would be able to achieve the objectives and goals. Next slide, please. So the value is so much in the eye of the beholder. And what we have here are what we call um, product partners. Many people would call these uh, stakeholders. So we see these as three different categories. There's the customer who might be the person who uses the product or the person who might actually buy the product. Not always the same person. And then there might be an advisor from a customer perspective. On the lower left we have the business and those perspectives might be the sponsor for the product, the product champion, uh, it could be a provider if you're buying a product and you can have advisors. And in the lower right, we have the technology perspective. Those are the folks who are actually going to build it. And it might be if we're purchasing it, they could be providing the particular product to us. And again, advisors. 
So if we look at all of these different parties, um, when we think about our business value model, we have something we call value considerations. So let's take an example of the customer. The customer may value the cost of the product or convenience, maybe say ease of use. Whereas the business sponsor may value increasing the revenue or maintaining or gaining in a competitive position, or it might even be satisfying regulatory constraints. That's a value for them, that the product would not violate any regulatory constraints. Now, the technology stakeholders, their value might be to align the product with existing technology. So you can see that these different perspectives, wow, it, it gets very challenging. So the value consideration is something we use as just a variable to be able to assess one product option versus another. Now, I want to be really, really clear. Value considerations are not features. Let me give you an example. That customer uh, may value the convenience. Uh, they want a product that's very convenient to use. That's a value. A feature is they want to be able to search for a product by location to find a closest location where they could purchase the product. Or it might be convenience could be they want to order the product online or they want 24-hour support. All of those are features we can build. But how do we rate or value one feature on another against another would be based on that value of convenience. Now, when we look at these three different perspectives, many times we can find that they have differing values. They can actually have competing or conflicting perspectives on values. This gets really, really challenging. Um, a couple years ago, I attended Agile Games in Boston. It was a great conference. And a group of us created a game called The Backlog is in the Eye of the Beholder. And then a few months later, Ellen and I played the game with the Boston IIBA chapter. We had over 60 folks playing this game, uh, five people to a team. And uh, over the years, we've learned a lot from that game. And if you'd like to get the rules for that game, I'd be glad to send them to you. Just email me. I do want to um, say that the key learning that always comes out from this game is that people get the sense by exploring different perspectives, they progressively get a deeper understanding of those value considerations. Next slide, please. Now, when we make value decisions, it's a balancing act. We've got a lot of things we're trying to evaluate. And let's say we're trying to look at a set of product options or features. What would be included in the next release? We don't have time or money to do it all. So how would we pick the right features to go into that particular planning cycle? Well, as you can see here, we would have to balance the benefits, meaning the aspects of the product that would favorably impact the value versus risks. Now, those risks would be things that endanger the success of our product. And of course, risks, there are acceptable risks, and things like, I really don't know exactly what the software is going to look like, but I can accept that and move forward, versus an unacceptable risk, maybe the cost of delaying delivery. Uh, that risk is really high. It might affect our reputation, or we might have uh, financial losses. And then we also have to balance dependencies. Uh, for example, a dependency might be one option, another product option. Say you have to deliver feature B before you deliver feature A. No, probably the other way around. So balancing those dependencies. And then there are project dependencies. Your project is dependent on another project to build an interface. Or it could be an external factor, such as you're dependent on the delivery of some hardware. And then we have to factor in those value considerations, remembering what the customer values may not be aligned with what the business sponsor values or what the technology values. So all of these things are this high wire act that we're, we're on and trying to make certain decisions. So let's say you finally get across the the other side, you're safe, 
and you say, oh, we finally made a decision about these features. It's like, phew, we're done. But as Julian mentioned, we may have to, from a timing perspective, be prepared. We may have to revisit those decisions, maybe because of uh, shifting market conditions or competitive release um, or possibly a change in funding or regulatory aspects. So all of these value decisions, um, absolutely essential that we do this. I would like to say, um, in my little part right here, by saying teams are making value decisions all the time, especially agile teams. And as Maureen mentioned, um, in January, she graciously hosted Ellen and me for the webinar author book conversation about our new book to discover to deliver. And in that, Ellen and I shared the structured conversation framework that we use to help teams make decisions based on value. And those value considerations I've just been talking about are the foundations for those conversations. And Maureen mentioned that you can access that webinar and um, I believe the transcript on the IIBA site. Um, I'll turn it over to Joy. OK. Thanks, Mary. Um, so I'm not going to promise explosive debate here, because typically what we find out, Julian and I, in the end, more agree than disagree. Um, but I'll try and throw some controversial statements in here to mix it up a bit. Um, but let me start out by just saying that I think when I, when I describe value, I want to think about the context I'm describing it in. That is really important. And the word stakeholder becomes critical to that statement. So what is a thing worth to a stakeholder? From different perspectives, value will mean different things. So I have some statements up here. I won't read them for you, but you can kind of skim them. For example, need search feature so that I can satisfy my customers, right? That search is a value to my customers so they can find something. But I think it's really important we also step back and ask, why do we care what value is? Why do we need a definition of that? Um, and make sure we're on the same page with that. And I think that Mary and Julian have touched a little bit on this. But in the end, I simply say it by value helps us implement the right things, right? What are the features that we need to build in our product? What processes do we need to change or add um, in our organization to achieve some kind of value? So ultimately, understanding what the value is to the different stakeholders will help us build the right product. And then we can ultimately return, um, maximize return in our organizations. So that gets to my next point uh, on the next slide. And this is where I make the slightly controversial statement that I think in organizations, value does equate to money. We are either trying to increase revenue or reduce costs. And almost everything we do in organizations comes back to money. Now, that doesn't mean we don't care about the stakeholder's value when it's not about money. But what we want to do is connect what value is to them back to something related to money that's of value in the organization. So I have this example here. We talked about this search feature that leads to satisfied customers. Well, in my organization, I ask, why do I care about satisfied customers? Well, that's because then my customers will, in theory, buy more. And if they buy more, that means more revenue. And simply put, Businesses exist to make money and then decrease costs, of course, so that they can make more money. And so it sounds really controversial. It's hard for some people to accept. But I do think it all does relate back to that. Um, it also gives us something very nice to consistently measure against. If we can take all of our features and tie them back to how they contribute, and I'm in some ways money, you can't see me, but I'm putting quotes around that. Uh, then we can compare them to one another and decide which ones add more value to the organization and build those first, or only build those. Um, I often hear about projects, let me give you an example, where maybe we're trying to combine seven systems into one. Okay? That doesn't intrinsically add value the way that we say that. The business does not care about combining systems into one. They never care about that. But when you say to them, it's going to cut my cost by millions of dollars, then they start to care. That sounds interesting to them. That might be a value. And um, Julian's point that value is not always about money, I'll agree with that if we step outside the organization world into my personal life. I absolutely have values that have nothing to do with money. And so I'm making a very clear distinction that inside an organization it does. And if we go back to his example of the insurance company, sure, I can agree with the statement that money does not replace parents by any means. 
but the insurance company exists to make money. I guarantee that. Um, and I'm not trying to say that to be mean. I'm just trying to tell you from their perspective, I feel like it does, the decisions around their policies are going to roll back to how do we as an organization maximize our profit. Um, okay, next slide, Maureen. So one of the things that is challenging, I think, about discovering value, particularly when we're talking about money, is getting down, getting executives and organizations to talk about projects and how they relate to money. It's a very, very hard thing to do. People don't like to be held accountable for numbers like that. It's easier to say, let's build this system to improve the customer experience, or let's build it to satisfy our customers. Those are easy statements to make, but they're hard to measure. Um, so I've given you kind of an example of a conversation that uh, a VA might have with somebody, like an executive, to try and get to it. So you start out with what is the product that we're building, and you ask why. Why are we building it? And they might tell you, you know, something like our customers are trying to find solutions to their problem online, so that's why we want to build search into this thing. Okay, well then we might ask, well, why do we care about them doing it online? And each answer we get, we can ask another question that involves why. Why are we trying to do this, right? Just explore a little bit more, and eventually you walk this chain up, and you'll get an answer that relates to money, okay? And so in this particular example, we find out that they're trying to cut costs. It's too expensive the way it is right now. This is a very brief example, and um, I think Julian's going to share with you guys the link to a PDF on our website that has this as part of a full model, so you can kind of see how you build up the model, and this is just a sample of a conversation, um, and that conversation will be in the PDF as well for reference. Um, but again, the point of this is I need to understand, if I can figure out why, why does my executive care about building a product? and how does it translate to value for the organization, then I can keep a razor sharp focus as I'm building out the features to make sure I'm building the right features with the right thing in mind, right? So if I understand that I need to um, reduce costs in my call center and think about how do I drive call volume away from phone calls and to an online system, right? If I have that in my mind as I start to pick features and build out requirements, I'm more likely to build a product that actually delivers value to the organization. Okay, that was the end. Thanks, Maureen. Joy, thanks, Mary and Julian. So, we have some great comments from our audience, and uh, I think I'm going to start off with the money question. Tim uh, says, Joy, thank you for uncovering the ugly truth about business. Despite the marketing, it's always been about money. So, Julian, I'd like to throw it out to you. What do you think of that statement? Well, I think that the, the distinction in, in the position that, that I, I take, and I think Mary probably takes, and, and, uh, and how it is distinct from joy, is that I, I certainly believe that money is necessary. Uh, I, there's no way that you're going to hear me say that we can ignore money. Um, it, it, it is necessary. It's just not sufficient. And, and I say that even in the context of a, a business environment, because most of the things that drive customers Un, uh, unless you're talking about a most basic commodity, most of the things that drive customers to make purchases uh, don't have to do explicitly with money. They, that is a component, but there are many, many other components. And Mary, you mentioned uh, the iPhone. or uh, you know, The iPhone didn't have more better functionality necessarily than, than other phones at the time, it, it, but it was groundbreaking in lots of ways because it combined that functionality into a package that had much greater value um, than just the dollar value. Now, the consequence of that was that ultimately Apple could, you know, make lots of money on it, but that wasn't the purpose. Mary, you want to carry on on that? Yeah, Julian. I mean, we could talk about this for some period of time. I'd also like to be, to be clear that sometimes we're working with I say a nonprofit organization or a governmental organization, and they can't always have it exclusively increasing revenue or reducing costs. There are certain things that have value um, that don't reach those particular aspects. Yep. Add from Paul on the line that he says that pretty much the same thing you're saying is that worth of something is measured uh, using money, but some organizations, such as nonprofit or governments, do not measure worth uh, using dollars. So um, I'll jump in on this because I, I run into that argument quite frequently. I think many times that 
government or nonprofits actually do tie back to money, and I see cost cutting as an example of that. But I actually had someone give me a fantastic example from a university um, two weeks ago. And the example was around, he was thinking to himself about, well, I'm in a university, we care about education, that's not money. But then he started to think about it, and he's like, well, you know what? We're trying to improve the quality of our education so that we can get more research dollars in the university. Right? So it's um, potentially there is something under that if we get creative and think about it that might be driving us. Hey, but Joy, Joy. So they want to get more research dollars. Why? Yeah, they don't want the research dollars and, because and they want money. Is it the administration's value to get more research dollars? What about the researchers themselves? What's their value? I don't think it's going to come down to money for them. Many times it's they have an overarching um, value that isn't a dollar amount. It's to be known in their field. It's to be able to cure cancer. So how do you put a, a value, dollar value on that? Yeah. And this gets back to the point that individuals and their lives outside of organizations absolutely have values that don't relate to money. Right? If I personally, um, I got excited about writing a book and it wasn't to make money. I got excited because it was an achievement for me personally that I'm excited about. Right? So I'm not saying that there isn't value out there that isn't related to money. Um, I'm talking about, and, and, and be clear that I'm primarily talking about organizations that are for profit. That is where the bulk of us end up doing business analysis and not everybody. But that's where I'm coming from is not to say there isn't value out there that isn't about money, but when we're in companies, it's about money. So let's okay. take an example from, uh, say, SpaceX uh, or one of the, the companies that's currently trying to, uh, to, to create or is creating commercial um, space flight. So those companies um, need to minimize their costs and are certainly trying to maximize their profits. Makes total sense. One of the most expensive things that you possibly can do associated with uh, spacecraft is to uh, make sure that the systems that keep people alive in space are multiply redundant and working perfectly. So, and even when they don't work perfectly, that people don't die. That's very expensive. Now, um, when you talk about dollar value and reducing everything to dollars, one of the places where it would certainly be tempting from an accounting point of view to cut costs would be in those systems because they're very expensive. But there's an overarching value statement about human life and ultimately about the success of the organization and the purpose of the organization, which is not strictly about dollars. Dollars are necessary but not sufficient. So I fundamentally, um, Julian, I feel like I'm not disagreeing with that statement. I do think that at the end of the day, if the company didn't put the investment into those systems, then that says something about the cause their company in, right? So if like, they, like the cruise ships? Like if people send, um, if they send people up into space and they die, well, that's not a sustainable business, clearly. So it's about when you're trying to decide, um, if we go back to your Apple example, Apple wants to make money, great. They're going to sit there and think about, okay, well, what will cause people to buy our phone? What do they care about? And they have to think about that in order to build a product that will actually drive revenue for them. So let's so go wait, back. I, I want okay, to jump in here because can you go to slide 13, please, Julian? I think uh, Maureen can take us there. All right. I'm sorry, Maureen. It's the one that says value considerations at the top. It's got the three circles. Hey, Joy, who are you talking about? When you right. talk about make money, which of these three perspectives are you talking about? So I am talking, that's, that's I guess what I was trying to say in my very first slide, that value is in the eyes, I call it in the eyes of the beholder, right? It's value. Yeah, that's the game I mentioned, yeah? But so, if you so look joy. at slide 13, I believe that you are overly focused on the business. Let's let's take a, a real world example of something that's just been in the news recently, um, because because I think this is where this is the motivation that I have for being so passionate about this. We have had a series of cruise ships that have tipped over sideways, run aground, had toilets that don't work. Uh, people have been in in real peril. Now, that says something about the, the companies that ran those organizations or that, that ran those ships or run those ships, and it says something about their business model. 
but they made a decision to cut costs because that's what they thought was value. I'm projecting a little bit, but I think it's a reasonable argument. So what I'm saying is that if you don't explicitly look at th these value considerations, think about these things, uh, value beyond the accountants, uh, 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 the, beyond the dollars, then that will lead to decisions like cruise ships with 5,000 people pooping in bags. So Julian, also the business people could say a value is they protect their reputation. That's not a you know a tangible thing. You can't put a dollar value to saying protect our rep or enhance our reputation. So the, the so premise I, that Ellen and I make is these value considerations are not just the head and the accounting. Some of them are around the heart. And you look at a user and the user, the person who buys the product, they want to appear to be cool. They want to be with it if you're talking about the iPhone. Or it may have some aspect about, you know, Joy, your point about you as, well, as an author, I won't, <laughs> we could talk about that in a long time about that some evening. But we have found that if we don't look from all three perspectives, balance these, understand who the beholders are, the I is in the beholder, I absolutely agree with you. But if we don't look these, at these and balance them and make um, a decision that we're going to forego some value consideration for the business to support the user or vice versa, or maybe technology holds the trump card, what they're seeing as value is going to have to necessarily not be aligned with the customer value. But so Joy, if we don't address these together, if we don't look at these holistically, we're not going to have a, a comprehensive holistic product. And so, and so Mary, that's a really good point. This is Maureen. And I wanted to uh, break in a little bit because I think Sherry has a question that will allow Joy to um, sort of elaborate a little bit. And Sherry asks, um, and I'm just going to quote here, uh, not everyone in an organization is thinking about money, some are not, and if they are empowered to make decisions based on value considerations, money may not factor in. How does this fit into your model? Yep, that's a great question, um, and it leads to a point that I wanted to make anyway. So I think that, you know, when I'm working as a business analyst on a project, I don't have the authority to spend millions of dollars and make that kind of decision about the product. but. When I'm in that position, I can ask questions around, why are we doing this? And I'm going to walk up a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy that um, gets us back to money. Right? So if somebody tells me, I, so like the cruise ship example, maybe the business is saying, I care about uh, protecting our reputation. And I will say, OK, why do you care about that? Well, because I want to have customers in the future signing up for my cruise. OK, great. Why do you want that? so that we can stay in business, right? I'm tying it back to money very, very quickly. But the point is that the person who is telling me they care about the reputation, that is absolutely their first reaction. That is the thing that, that's valuable to them. My job as a VA is to help walk it up this hierarchy and have the conversations with people to get us there. So um, we build out, we call them object objectives, business objectives, and we build out a hierarchy of them. And the very top level ones are about money, and the very low level ones are not. They're about all of these different things because I've got to think about, you know, what does my customer care about? What does my end user care about? Right? And, and take their value and turn it into how do I as a business make money? And that's important to make that connection because at the end of the day, the businesses are investing in products. They're choosing to build things or to cut costs. And they may be making the wrong choice, but as soon as, you know, I'm willing to bet these cruise companies who made those cost-cutting choices are now thinking, oh, geez, what do I do? I need to understand how do I, you know, make more money. And I put it simply, but how do I get back that uh, value that my company did have that doesn't have now? And I do it by thinking about what have I done to my end users. People make wrong choices all the time. Absolutely, that happens. Um, and I think that maybe that did happen in the cruise world, to Julian's point, something's gone wrong there. But that's great. Let's take that now and turn that into, okay, well, how do I turn it around. How do I, you know, where do I need to spend money? And again, the cruise company isn't doing it just for people who have fun on cruises. They're doing it so that they can stay in business, which is about making money. So this brings me to another question from Keith, and I, I think it, it uh, ties in nicely with the whole idea of money and the cruise ship example. Uh, so Keith says, 
A company brand is not money, so does it have value? Who would like to take that on? Could you repeat that just for a second? That was really good. Sure. A company brand is not money, so does it have value? Mm. Deep. That was very deep. <laughs> it is very deep. Keith, you're good. Uh, but I think it might tie into this cruise ship idea and so on in that, and I'm, you know, this is just my thought, is that uh, if the brand, the cruise ship brand, suffered because of this issue around maybe decisions around money, in essence, does it really uh, trace back to money in that they're going to lose business and so on and their brand will suffer? I can try my okay. first. I'll end the first, and then let Mary and uh, Julian chime in. But I think that um, I don't know if I would equate the words brand to money by any means. But when I think about from a company's perspective, they absolutely care about their brand and the image of their brand um, across the customer base because what they're looking for is if somebody needs to go buy a product and I'm selling that product, I want the customer to think of me, right? So top of mind brand is important to a company. And you will see some organizations will invest money to try and build brand recognition in hopes of increasing revenue. There are other places where you won't see that because they know that that actually doesn't have a big impact on who buys their product or who doesn't. So I think it will depend on the organization whether they invest in, they invest money in the image of their brand. Wow, I agree with you, Joy. Ah, finally. Yay! <laughs> well, because I think that there is this, there is the intrinsic value, and if you are a unique product, then that intrinsic value I think is is heightened. If you're a commodity product, you probably don't think about that. It, that's not as important to you. So I'm not sure if we answered that deep question, but um, I do feel that this aspect of um, intrinsic aspects to it, getting to the heart of why people make decisions is often something we don't feel comfortable in doing in a business environment. We're so focused on, you know, the dollars and cents or the euros or whatever we use to come up with that bottom line. And I think that that's a flaw in our, our, our decision making. I'd like to build on that a little bit. I think that, I mean, I agree with you guys that, that um, brand and money aren't the same um, because you, you can't buy brand value. Brand value is something that's talked about a lot by a lot of organizations, um, but you can't just spend money to buy a brand. Uh, it, takes, it takes engagement with people, and as you say, uh, Mary, it takes engagement with people so that they want to think about you or they, your organization, your brand comes to top of mind. Um, so, so there is certainly a dollar consequence to your brand. Um, you know, ask uh, ask McDonald's where they did a an uh, ask me anything an AMA and set put up uh, posters with things like why doesn't your food rot? Um, I mean, they they went out on a limb and they showed themselves as an organization that they were willing to talk to their customers head on and uh, and to be upfront and honest, and that showed something about their brand, whether you like their food or not. Um, that made a difference, and I'm sure that it made a difference to their bottom line. Um, but the, 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 those kinds of elements, those things about brand value, go way beyond just the, the dollar value. Uh, and yeah, you need to be able to quantify them, but quantify, there are other ways to quantify than just by asking how many dollars do we get or do we save. Um, you, know, you, can, you can look at things like um, customer retention or uh, new customer acquisition and things like that, which are very, very uh, numerical, they are quantifiable, and they do talk about uh, the strength of your brand or the strength of your organization, but they aren't the same as, say, revenue or profit. And Julian, just one more item that's just, I found, I've got a client right now, first to market is their value. They're going to lose money, Joy. They may not, you know, they may not be successful, but they need to get first to market. That's really important Ma to them. So Mary, why do they need to be first to market? Why would you ever choose to do that if you guaranteed it was going to lose money? It's because not guaranteed. 
the yeah. ends are never guaranteed. The, well, you know, okay, and guarantee may be too strong, but why would you even take that strategy if you thought it was going to be a losing strategy? Also, because they're problem. entrepreneurs. They, they have a, a high tolerance for risk, and their value is to put this to, out to the market. Right, and they're trying to sell it. If they don't believe that long term it'll make them a lot of money, they wouldn't be doing it. Or I would argue they're just making a poor choice. So, so let's take it from a different point of view, um, because Joy, you're talking about these things in a. I think you're talking about value in a relatively simplistic way, where we're dealing with just a simple cause and effect. But um, like, why does advertising exist? I watch a television show, I see ads, I pay nobody anything, but the advertiser pays the content creator for me watching. The you know Value is moving through that system and not all of it involved dollars, uh, particularly not all of it involved my dollars. I'm paying by watching ads, I'm paying with my time. Now, so, so like the, the value relationship there and the business models when you get into things like a three-party market and, and many other business models as well, by the way, uh, involve value being moved around, but not all the value being moved is money. Money is still necessary. Yep. And I feel, I feel like I'm getting a little bit redundant with myself, but um, <laughs> that happens. I feel like the, the people who are paying for the ad care about money. You, Julian, watching the ad probably don't care about money. I'm talking about it from the business perspective that they care. That's why they chose to put an ad is because they thought it would help them make money. You, Julian, are watching the ad either A, because you're interested in the product, or B, because you're too lazy to change the channel during the commercial. It could be that, right? But the point is that um, from, the, from your perspective, it is absolutely not about money. I totally agree with that. Um, so I'm talking about what the business. I, but but the, the broader business perspective is not just the advertiser. When we're, as a BA, I need to look at when I'm working, say, for that advertiser or when I'm working for the, the television company or the media production company or uh, you know, the, the software development company, I need to be thinking about more than just uh, the, the dollar value associated with the direct sale. I need to be thinking about the things that, that will provoke someone to want to buy it in the first place. I need to think about uh, the, the relationship that the customer will have with that product, for example. Because um, if I don't think about those things, then I could make it free and people still wouldn't buy it. Um, I'm going to break in just for a second, and although this might be not quite on the topic of, of advertising and, and time and value uh, money, um, I think Robin uh, has a comment, and here it is. Julian, there's no future in trying to maintain magical thinking. Joy is much more on target, but quantification is still relevant to personal and not-for-profit situations. Um, I know we're going back to the not-for-profit, but he has a point. CROI is deceptive without real requirements, quantified intangibles, requirements. Networking group featured an article on March 20th, 2007, and I won't read off the URL, but uh, so I just thought I'd get uh, Robin's point in there. I'm curious about what magical thinking is involved here, particularly since um, I've, certainly my opinion is based on, um, on going through a lot of pretty hard-nosed scientific research and, and uh, work that's been done on how humans interact with value um, and, and what we actually, like how we actually behave as opposed to how we'd like to behave. Um, and, you know, based on, on things like, um, oh good lord, his name just flew out of my head, uh, the uh, Nobel laureate who uh, came up with prospect theory and things like that. So um, I think it's, a, I guess all I'm saying is that uh, I, I truly do believe that what Joy is talking about is extremely important and the technique that she's talking about and, and you know I've read about it in, in uh, one of her recent books, The Visual Models for Software Requirements, uh, it's a great technique and it applies extremely well well, to any situation where you can quantify value. Money is one way to quantify value and a, and a necessary way, and if you don't quantify value by money at all, you're probably going to have a problem um, and a big one. But if you stop with only quantifying value by money, you will also have a problem. And Julian, I, this is where I don't think we necessarily disagree as much as it sounds, because what I'm talking about when I say that is walk down the hierarchy to figure out how does money translate into something that your customer cares about. 
and Mary, I suspect you would say walk up the hierarchy one, well, uh, one level past uh, the money to make sure that it still aligns to the vision. Absolutely. And, and I do feel, I just like to, you know, I, you guys have heard this before, but I do not like to use the concept of a role. I do not like to think about the business analyst. What we're talking about is doing business analysis. We are analyzing the business. And regardless of what hat you're wearing with the title on it or shirt with a logo on it, we are really trying to get these three partner perspectives to communicate together. And when you think about certain value models, I, I don't. I think maybe to be maybe we could do a value stream map. We could use the Kano model. There are so many different tools that we could use to help us. Um, when you start thinking about the different kinds of things like an empathy map, bringing these in, purpose alignment model, there are so many different tools that we could use to help us collaboratively understand the value of all three perspectives. That's what I hope we can reach. Yeah, I certainly agree with you, Mary, that, that um, it's, it's uh, like from a, regardless of the title, um, you know, anyone who is performing business analysis work, it's really important to, to think of the, the picture that is uh, just about the money, but also the picture that's around the money. And, uh, I, you know, Joy and I have had, as you can probably tell, lots of debates on this topic, and it certainly has uh, changed the way that I think about money. I think two years ago I might have said, well, you don't have to worry about the money as much. So, you know, you made progress with me anyways. <laughs> Well, and, and, and you know, it's always going to come back to money at some point in a conversation, in a project, uh, but I think the value discussion, uh, looking at all the pieces, is really important too. So I'd like to switch just a little bit because someone brings up uh, a pretty good question about what is value add? And that's from Steve. I tend to look at value as it is used in the term value add, which I see as self-explanatory. Something is added to the original. Anyone have any comments on value add? Hmm. Hmm. Well, from an agile perspective, you know, a lot of the teams we're working on with, um, the need is to come up with that minimum marketable feature what is the absolutely essential aspect that we can deliver and then making those choices to depending on time money resources being able to then add other aspects but the ability for us to elaborate elaborately develop a product first thing we want to do and i think this is to your point joy we want to build some aspects, some essential part of the product and get it out there, get it to the marketplace and validate our learning to determine if we are going to achieve those results. Are we going to meet those particular objectives and those goals? And if that's clear, if that essential aspect, the minimum of what we can deliver does reach those particular um, ends, then we can go and add more. But uh, the we need some sort of proof. We need some validated learning to determine if the product is, in fact, valuable to those stakeholders. Yeah, and I, so I agree with all that, Mary. And it's funny. I'm thinking a lot about the um, minimal, minimum marketable feature. Wow, that's hard to say <laughs> right now. Um, I'm at, actually writing about that right now. So totally aligned with you on that, uh, which is exciting in itself. Yay! I, yay. Yeah. <laughs> When I hear the phrase value add, I actually use that pretty synonymously with value. And I don't know that that's right or wrong. I just have heard myself say, what's the value add? And what I'm saying is, what is the value? Um, so I don't know, Julie, if you have a different way that you think about that phrase. Uh, I tend to think of value add in the same category as intangible value or, or many of the other modifiers we use around value. Um, we recognize that there's a some core call it tangible value, something uh, like a set of features or uh, a collection of uh, capabilities that comes with a product or with a software, with whatever. Um, and then we ask the question, but what does it mean? Like, why should I care? What's the value add? Uh, um, so, you know, I think that um, 
it's a it's an indicator that that people do recognize that there's more to the story and need to find a way of talking about it. Excellent. Well, we have time for about one more question. We have oh, four more minutes left. And so I think I'll, uh, Sean asks, I think, a good question. Why is time not considered a major part of value? If you aim to improve business processes, that is a big component which would lead to cost savings. So. Um, do we consider time and value? And uh, I, I like the idea that he brought up process improvement. I'll, I'll answer first, um, if that's okay. So mm -hmm. I would say time is part of value in some situations, and it's very situation dependent. But if I have a process and I am trying to reduce the time to execute that process, um, and I'm doing it because it either saves me costs or increases my revenue, again, I'm sounding redundant then absolutely time is part of how I deliver that value. And so in my hierarchy, I would um, either walk up or down, it doesn't matter, but the point is I would connect time to value in that particular case. And that's one example where time is value. In some cases, I think maybe it's not. Um, somebody thinks, hey, I want to reduce the time to execute this process, but um, that's not necessarily going to help the organization make money cut money, whatever it may be. Um, and then I would just leave it out of the equation completely. I wouldn't. I wouldn't focus any efforts on that unless it does relate back to money. Yeah, I really think um, Joy's point was important. It's very contextual. And again, the, the time element, the business may see time differently than the customer sees time versus technology. So we always come back to those three perspectives, making sure that we consider that uh, all of those perspectives and making that decision. Uh, well, you know what, I, although this might be quite the discussion, I think Wanda brings up a good point before we end today's session, and that is um, uh, I've had projects that did not save money but actually cost money, but they were due to regular, pardon me, regulatory compliance, and it's just necessary. So where does regulatory compliance come into value? And maybe that's just way too big a question for three minutes left. I actually have a short Should I answer. Jump? Oh, go ahead, Julian. Quick, real quick. <laughs> then I want to um, pitch in. Yeah, um, uh, depending on the nature of the regulation, um, it, it may not be about money. It may be about e an existential threat. Think about it this way. If you have a regulation like Sarbanes-Oxley or something like that, uh, or you know the FDA, and you fail to meet the regulation, your company is shut down. It doesn't matter how much it costs. I mean, it may matter how much it costs in the sense that if you can't pay it, you're going to get shut down anyways, and in which case you're between a rock and a hard place. But generally, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of regulations are an existential threat that must be dealt with irrespective of the, the total cost, uh, as long as you can stay in business. And I would just pipe in that you're avoiding penalties. So that would link to joy where you want to actually protect your revenue. You may not increase it, you're not reducing costs, but you're just holding it. So you don't have to pay any penalties if you violated the regulatory um, constraints. Mary, you made my point for me. Thank you. <laughs> so, something else to think about with, with uh, regulations is that um, most regulations, under most circumstances, have a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, not exclusively, but, but a lot of them do. I used to work for a, a big bank, and uh, the bank would talk to the regulators all the time and say, okay, well, we want to comply this way. It's going to take us this much time. The deadline was Thursday, and it's going to take us till Saturday. Uh, are you okay with that? And so there was, there was usually a little bit of space to, to move. Um, so don't, don't just think that regulations are uh, made of granite. Well, thanks for that. And I can't believe that this panel actually all came together and agreed in the long run. What a wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed it. And based on all of the conversation going on in the questions box and all of the comments, I apologize we couldn't get to them all. A lot of very good information in there. And, and you can access all of our webinars under the Professional Developments tab. Uh, webinars, there's archived webinars. You can play them back. And of course, there's the transcript. I'd like to thank everyone who attended as participants everyone who added wonderful questions and almost stumped our panel, uh, but you couldn't do that. Uh, thank you to Julian, lots of good information. Uh, Joy, it's been a joy to have you on the session and uh, lots of, you know, lots of good comments for people to think about and hopefully take back and apply. And Mary, as always, thank you for joining us at IIBA 
for our webinar today. I kind of wish there was a pun that I could have on my name. Mary made us merry, Joy was joyful, and Julian just talked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's not true. Whoops. So thank you everyone and have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning and uh, a round of applause to everyone on the panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Maureen. Thanks guys. This was a